Coming up in today's newscast, the Prime Minister of Japan visits Netanyahu in Jerusalem. Israel reopens talks with the United Nations for safely resettling African asylum seekers in the West. And it's only May, but we're feeling the summer heat in Tel Aviv. That's why we're counting down the top five ways to work out outside. Today, the Gaza border is as tense as ever. A Palestinian man has just been shot by IDF troops after attempting to damage the security fence. Security forces have arrested the man and administered medical care. He is currently in Belsheva's Soroka Medical Center in serious condition. The Army has confirmed that the man had a pair of wire cutters and a knife on him at the time of his arrest. This would confirm suspicions that the man was possibly intending to infiltrate the border altogether and even potentially carry out a terror attack. Incidents like these have begun to bleed into the weekdays during the last several weeks of the Hamas-sponsored march of return. Earlier this week, three Palestinians were shot and killed in three separate attempted infiltrations along the Gaza border. Gazans have also repeatedly been flying firebombs to Israel over the border using homemade kites. And the dry summer heat has fanned some of these flames to dangerous heights. Israel believes these so-called peaceful protests are merely a cover for terror, especially since the rallies are set to coincide with the opening of the new U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem in less than two weeks. Security officials are already bracing for more violence to come. Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu has just hosted Japan's Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in Jerusalem for diplomatic talks. Netanyahu was very keen to brief the Japanese leader on Israel's massive score of intel detailing Iran's nuclear program in the 2000s. But even after seeing the details of the archive, Abe reportedly told Netanyahu that Japan backs the current nuclear deal with Iran and that the deal does in fact help stabilize a turbulent Middle East. Though not a signatory on the JCPOA, Japan is a country whose contemporary years are defined by the horrors of nuclear power. To this day, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II by the U.S. are the only time the bomb has ever been used on civilians. Japan also plays a critical role in monitoring North Korea's nuclear development. Abe has also told Netanyahu that Israel should slow down developing settlements in areas of the West Bank and that Japan would not be relocating its embassy to Jerusalem. But regardless of where they don't see eye to eye on politics, relations between Japan and Israel have flourished over the last several years. Japan has become a hot spot for Israeli tourism and business. So much so that Abe and Netanyahu have just agreed to promote new direct flights between Tel Aviv and Tokyo. Abe even brought a delegation of Japanese CEOs with him on his trip. They likely have big ideas in store for how to combine Japanese innovation with a cutting-edge Israeli startup nation. Turkey, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates have just invested a whopping quarter of a billion dollars into East Jerusalem. The money is said to be used to restore the city's holy Muslim sites, but it comes just two weeks before the U.S. Embassy opens in Jerusalem. Israeli officials worry that given this timing, this effort will only stir more chaos during a very delicate period. The donors describe these funds as a rescue effort of sorts to renovate holy sites throughout East Jerusalem. This includes the Temple Mount, home to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, dozens of Islamic archives, and even schools and orphanages. But with the ribbon-cutting ceremony of the new American embassy just around the corner, the concern is that the money would only end up fueling violence. Either way, officials and security experts are certainly expecting the worst in the coming weeks. The opening of the U.S. Embassy will also coincide with a Hamas-sponsored six-week-long March of Return protest. These weekly rallies have erupted into bloodshed for five consecutive weekends along the Gaza border. The army has seen countless attempts by Gazans to destroy or breach the security barrier, and Israel has in return used live force to contain the riots when necessary. Over 40 Palestinians, including two teenagers and two journalists, have been killed at this time. 
Well, United States President Donald Trump is expected to announce his stance on the Iranian nuclear agreement next week, and most of the international community has been trying to convince Trump to remain a participant in the JCPOA. Well, now United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres has again thrown his hat in the ring, pleading with Trump not to nix the deal without a viable alternative. Here now in the studio with more is senior research fellow at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, Major General Gilshona Cohen. Thanks for joining us. All right, so w will nixing the deal without a viable alternative lead to war, as Guterres is asserting? Not necessarily, and not, uh, it is not a deterministic uh, phenomenon. Anyhow, the danger of, for warfare is here from a lot of reasons. But uh, I cannot say that there is a direct connection between the decision of Trump and the emerging of war. Interesting. Now, but in the event that there was a war, where do you think the lines, uh, you know, will be drawn? How far reaching do you think that war would be? Who would be the main players that are involved? Everyone thinking about Israel as one that could be the central participant in that war. Mm -hmm. But again, not necessary. Uh, we must think about the Iranian interest in Syria. As long as they want now to strengthen their position in Syria, war is not what they need. It is against their interest right now. Mm -hmm. So they have a lot of interest. And they, in the whole equilibrium, if the war will really emerge, it could really uh, give opportunity to the Israeli interests. It is not saying that the Israeli really wants war. Well, we are seeing that Israel in recent weeks has been ramping up uh, activity in Syria. Do you think this is perhaps in preparation for an escalation with Iran? Not directly in a just expecting escalation. It is to emphasize and to exemplify how much we can go on the abyss in order to express our interest and to say that we can even endanger the whole stability of the region and therefore it means that everyone thinking about the new order in Syria must think about the Israeli mm -hmm. interests. Well, I guess, you know, the final question here is how prepared is Israel um, to defend itself against a potential massive offensive from Iran? First of all, Israel is the most uh, ready, the most, uh, in the most readiness to war in comparing to all other states. Yet, warfare phenomena is chaotic by the essence. Right. So nobody really can be prepared for a war. Yeah. It is a very chaotic phenomena. Uh, nobody really expect it, but the IDF and the readiness of the main uh, infrastructure of Israel could really say that we are ready. All right. Well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Speaking of the United Nations, we've just learned that Israel has reportedly reopened talks with the UN to safely deport thousands of African asylum seekers to Western countries. This is the same deal Prime Minister Netanyahu infamously announced as the best possible one last month and then completely scrapped less than 24 hours later after backlash, of course, from members in his coalition. ILTV's Brett Allen Smith is here with more. And Brett, given what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, how should we be taking this? Well, for one, I think it's pretty safe to say that the government uh, has really kind of hit a roadblock here. You know, as we've discussed many times, that original plan to deport nearly 40,000 asylum seekers was just never going to be realistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, that whole plan sparked massive outrage from, you know, doctors, diplomats, rabbis, even Holocaust survivors all over the world. And not only that, but Israel's own court system repeatedly blocked those deportations because they were, you know, told that they were unconstitutional. So it's true that Netanyahu has put this deal with the UN back on the table. Probably it means that they've kind of run out of you know other options. Well, obviously, when this UN was uh, or or this the plan deal. was right. announced back in April, it was seen as a huge victory for the African asylum seeker community. The government refers to them as illegal infiltrators here, but the majority, who are mostly Christians from Eritrea and Sudan, would typically be accepted as refugees almost anywhere else in the right. world. Now, if the government brings this deal back, 
Would Israel be required to accept some as refugees in exchange for a resettlement? Right. I mean, almost definitely yes. So under the previous deal, uh, the UN would have resettled about half of those asylum seekers to Western countries, you know, like the, like Canada or the U.S., in exchange for Israel providing at least temporary asylum to the other half. And Netanyahu is going back to the negotiating table now after very publicly reversing and then canceling the deal. Yeah. So the UN says that it still wants something like this to work out because, you know, after all, these are tens of thousands of lives currently in limbo here. But if Netanyahu is hoping for, you know, a more favorable ratio here, I'm not sure if he's really coming from a good bargaining position right now. Yeah, probably not, especially since Israel's deals with Uganda and Rwanda right. to accept migrants deported against the world also fell apart rather publicly. Still, Netanyahu faced backlash because he had originally promised to expel every last asylum seeker from the country. Um, and at least two-thirds of the country was actually in favor of sure. that original controversial plan to remove men, women, and children by force if necessary. Sure, but at the same time, though, I will say that these same polls reflected rather badly on how Netanyahu handled that big 180 when he canceled that deal. So I think that the better interpretation of these statistics, my point of view, is that your average Israeli does want to see a solution. And it does want to see it done according to the law in a way that does reflect, you know, the, the Jewish spirit of hospitality to mm -hmm. refugees. And that's why so many people just want to see this deal. They, they see the, U, the UN deal as not just the best solution, as Netanyahu himself famously called it. They see it as the only real solution. Yeah. And legally, the government may have no other choice but to agree with that by now. Well, we'll have to see if it really works out this time. Thanks for the update, Brett. Of course. In a major first, women can now officially apply for the position of Knesset rabbi. This is a huge victory in the fight for equal rights for women in Israel, a step that's taken years of litigation and countless petitions. Until now, anyone who's wanted to apply for the post required a certificate or ordination directly from Israel's chief rabbinate. The rabbinate is Israel's top spiritual authority on all things Judaism, which often ties it to actual laws and practices. Marriage, divorce, kosher laws, burials, tons of laws that govern Israeli life typically fall under the discretion of the rabbinate. And when it comes to deciding who can and cannot be considered a rabbi, the rabbinate totally bars women altogether. Well, after years years of petitioning, activists and lawyers have finally changed the Knesset's rules. The Knesset now no longer requires an official certificate from the rabbinate and instead only needs a bachelor's degree and proof that the applicant can work as a kashrut supervisor. As we know, there are thousands of female rabbis all over the world, including here in Israel, serving as their community's spiritual leader. Typically, the Knesset's rabbi is mostly only tasked with enforcing the country's kosher laws in restaurants and cafeterias, which means not only are women fully qualified for the job, the same as men, but it's high time the rest of the country saw them that way. The current Knesset rabbi has recently announced his retirement, and who knows, maybe the country's first ever female Knesset rabbi is submitting her resume as we speak. Well, as medical treatments advance, it seems like so do the diseases that they treat. Antibiotic-resistant bacteria is a major challenge, but a new Israeli biomedical company has just revealed what could be the answer. Joining me with more in the studio is CEO of Biomica, Dr. Elran Haber. Thank you Hi. for joining us. It's great to be here. All right, well, the first big question is you deal with microbiome-based therapeutics. That's true. What are they, and in what ways can they be harnessed? Okay, so... Um there are trillions of bacteria, of microbes, living in and on our bodies. And these microbes have a tremendous potential to impact our uh, physiology in health and disease. Yeah. And the changes in the microbiome, in the microbes, are strongly um, correlated with various uh, kinds of diseases, ranging from uh, inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, to cancer. For example, in cancer, we know that cancer is a serious unmet medical need. And although many drugs have been developed in the recent years, uh, immunotherapy, for example, uh, one of the questions raised was why immunotherapy work for some patients mm -hmm. but not for others. And recent studies demonstrated that the um, composition of a patient's gut microbes has a tremendous effect and a great potential to, uh, this, to uh, impact if this patient would respond to immunotherapy or not. Interesting. So what specifically is Biomica focusing on here? So Biomica is an emerging biopharmaceutical company that uh, is developing, developing microbiome-based therapeutics. Mm -hmm. And our focus is currently mainly on antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria, uh, immuno-oncology, and uh, GI-related disorders. 
And Biomica is a subsidiary of Evagen, that is a Nasdaq uh, traded company that uh, we are using Evagen's technology uh, and we developed uh, proprietary computational tools in order to identify and characterize changes within the microbiome of the human wow. in order to develop novel therapies based on those understandings. So, so the bottom line here is your job is to try to save us from, from uh, <laughs> From our diseases. <laughs> Basically, that's that's the well, objective. Well, obviously, you know, uh, people who 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 just antibiotics don't work for them, right? So this is kind of the solution. All right, thank you so much for joining us, doctor. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, this weekend Israel kicks off the first leg of the Giro d'Italia cycling race in what will be one of the country's biggest sporting events of all time. Well, get this, now Israel has just dedicated its very first indoor velodrome racetrack. The project costs 70 million shekels and is specifically designed for the demands of advanced cycling. So a velodrome is no ordinary racetrack, folks, and in races like these, the bikes actually have no brakes. Instead, racers have to utilize the walls of their terrain to get their way to the front of the pack. For that reason, Tel Aviv's brand new Sylvan Adams Velodrome is outfitted with steep slopes. Some angles are as steep as 45 degrees, and when racers fly by, it almost looks like they're actually flying above the ground. Now, this is a three-year project that's set to finally open its doors in September. Construction demanded 900 tons of steel, and the premises contain everything needed to hold industry standard races. The stadium seats over 600 people, which means that by the end of the summer, an entire new sport will be open to Israeli audiences for the first time ever. This news is just the cherry on top of an incredible week for cycling fans and enthusiasts. The Giro d'Italia, second in prestige only to the Tour de France, kicks off in the Holy Land this Friday. Now get this, a pretty unusual protest is taking place in Tel Aviv this evening. The participants are all strippers who are coming together to fight a new proposed bill that would put stripping on legal par with prostitution. Now, prostitution isn't actually illegal in Israel, but if the legislation does pass, it would essentially ban people from owning locations where prostitution or stripping occurs, meaning strip clubs would probably go under. Well, lots of strippers who could face losing their jobs just aren't having it. Dozens are taking to the street and their signs say it all. My body, my business. Let us dance in peace and the stigma kills. Many of these women have been working in the industry for years and say they should have the right to decide what they do with their own bodies without having their jobs threatened. If this bill were to pass, strip club owners would ultimately become criminals and clubs would be illegal, meaning lots of these women would be without jobs. Results that 29 Israeli Knesset members from across the political spectrum are in support of. Knesset member Michal Rosin is behind the bill, which cites studies and proof about the exploitation and harm of women that work in the stripping industry. In fact, a report by the Israeli Awareness Center, Toda, says that the profile of women who go into stripping and the way they go into it is very similar to the way in which women get caught up in prostitution. Clearly, not every stripper agrees in today's Tel Aviv protest, with many saying it's the stigma about stripping that's hurting them, and not the customers. Speaking of empowering women, my next guest is now the focus of a solo exhibition in Petah Tikva's Bluebird Gallery. I'm very happy to welcome the artist, poet, and writer behind the Women in Landscape exhibition, Oshrit Mintz. Thanks for joining us. All right, so tell me first a little bit about this exhibition. What are you focusing on? I'm focusing on the th all the things that women go through, through their lives, as girls, as um, wives, everything. You know, they talked just now about women wanting to be rabbis. Whatever you want to be, you have to be much um, more smart, smarter than a man, and also you have to be beautiful all the time. Right. So that's not very easy to, to no, do. No, it's, anyway. it's not easy to live up to all these expectations. And it's interesting because I see some of these paintings where women are looking at the mirror and kind of seeing these images that they, they either are supposed to be or maybe want to be. What will you be showing at the exhibition? Most of these pictures, not all of them, are in the, at the exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, to empower women, to show that they can be everything. Yeah. My mother, which is in this picture, and there's a book about some of what he, she went through her life, mm -hmm. is the, the woman that was behind me. She taught me how to be a woman, how strong I can be, and that I can achieve everything that I want. Yeah, well, so I'm I mean, clearly you are, and I, I think that this is a type of artwork that kind of changes the perceptions about, about how women are supposed to behave, behave and act, right? So, you know, 
This is going to all be shown at the Bluebird Gallery, right? It's in it's Petah already there. Tifa, Rothschild it's 75, and, and um, has it already begun? Yeah, it has. Okay, and, the it, first. and it's going on until June 5th, so there's mm -hmm. a lot of time to be able to uh, yes. see this artwork. Is there anything that you think that people should keep in mind specifically about this exhibition? They should know that women have their own word, and they can be as clever and can do everything that a man can do, but also they have their own word which is a little bit different. There's yeah. a lot more feeling and anything else that a woman can do. Well, I, I mean, uh, I would love to go and check out this artwork and even read this book. I don't yeah. think it's in English yet, right? It's, it's not, not in English, it's, it's Hebrew, but you do. You yeah, Hebrew, I'll work on my Hebrew, but again, uh, such an important cause, uh, such an important topic to be talking about right now, especially uh, given everything that's been happening with the Me Too movement as yeah, well. Yeah, so. it's very connected to very the Me Very timely, very timely. Thank you so much for joining us, Social Thank Group. you. All right, the tiara has exchanged hands once again, and Miss Israel 2018 has finally been crowned. 18-year-old Nicole Reznivok was officially crowned on Tuesday night, but she has some big shoes to fill, especially since Israel's Wonder Woman Gal Gadot was once Miss Israel herself. Reznikov is still in high school in her hometown of Afula, but clearly she stands out. The teenage winner won the top prize in the Miss Israel competition, which she says she took part in to help bring media attention to weaker parts of Israeli society. As can be expected, Reznikov is all over Israeli television giving interviews following her big win, and she's clearly starstruck by herself. I never expected or imagined or believed this would happen. To be a queen gives you a lot of media power, and I want to do good with this power. Nicole Reznikov interestingly looks pretty similar to Israeli and international superstar Gal Gadot, who actually won the title of Miss Israel in 2004 when she herself was just 18 years old. Well, that may very well be a good thing for Reznikov when she heads to the Miss Universe pageant later this year. Well, we're just a few days uh, into May, but it already feels like summer here in the Holy Land, believe me. And now that the cold's behind us, ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here with her top five ways to work out outdoors. So other than the occasional rainstorm, it's safe to say summer in Israel has begun. And with that comes plenty of outdoor workouts to take part in. What's a little sweat without a view, right? So I'm here to give you guys the top five summer workouts you can do in Tel Aviv. First on our list is kite surfing. In recent years, this sport has taken over the city of Tel Aviv and is a great way to get in shape while enjoying the stunning Mediterranean. If you're looking to learn how to kite surf, there are a few places in Tel Aviv where you can rent equipment and take some lessons as well. So whether you're a pro or just beginning, this is an amazing way to get in shape and enjoy the water. Number two is rock climbing in Palkayalcon. This park is one of the biggest in Tel Aviv and offers running and biking trails, kayaking in the river, and most adventurous of all, a rock climbing wall. There's rental equipment offered and it's also very beginner friendly. So grab a friend and head over to Palkayalcon. If you're looking for a more traditional workout, number three is definitely for you. Outdoor gyms are offered all across the city of Tel Aviv, whether at parks or the beach. The free mini gym machines use body weight as resistance, helping keep the citizens of Tel Aviv healthy. Grab some water, jog to the beach or park, and get your workout in. Biking in Tel Aviv is fourth on our list. If you don't have your own bike, don't worry, because Telofun has rental bike stations all over the city. This allows people to get creative with where they start and finish their bike ride, and gives them a chance to explore all parts of the city. Whether hourly, weekly, or even monthly, bikes are available for anyone and everyone. Last but definitely not least is TRX. This workout that was developed in the Navy SEALs has since been adapted and taught all over the world. It's been reported that TRX improves total body strength and stability using suspension training to work against one's body weight. Just get your own straps, find a good spot, and get started. That's all for today's Top 5. Back to you. The Hebrew Word of the Day is brought to you by IDC Samrul Pan. Open to everyone. Well, now it's time for our Hebrew word of the day. Today was a big day for women fighting to shatter the glass ceiling. So today's word is nikiva, which is how you say the feminine gender in Hebrew. So Hebrew, unlike English, is a gender sensitive language. For most adjectives, there's a male version of the word, and then there's a female or nikiva version. But even the word for certain nouns are nikiva too. The word for eyes, for example, is completely nikiva, along with the word for shoes and eyebrows. But it turns out the word for a demonstration or a protest is also nikiva. It just goes to show that there's nothing more ladylike than a good pair of shoes to wear as you march for gender equality. If that ain't nikiva, I don't know what is. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy and warm with a low of about 71 or 22 degrees Celsius. Over the weekend, you can expect a rise in temperatures and partly cloudy skies with a chance of scattered showers. The high should be around 93 or 34 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.62 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV and don't forget to follow us on Facebook at Israel English News and on Twitter at ILTV News. I'm Natasha Kirchuk and thanks for watching.